Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And um, yeah, I'm really hoping that uh, you would find um, you would find this uh, informative. And um, what I think this uh, is twofold. I first would like to give you a little bit of an update on Cup Classic, uh, as it is our category for bottle fermented sparkling wine in South Africa. And then when he has asked me to go a little bit more into the sort of attention to detail, uh, I have a favorite motto in my life that says I'm in pursuit of the perfect bubble. And hopefully through that, there's a little bit of technical jargon that we can share um, and uh, then take on some questions and uh, some answers. So there'll be a basic overview of Cup Classic, uh, the sort of current, uh, current status quo. Uh, it is backed up with um, Sava statistics. So, uh, you know, those of you who do like some information, uh, we can share that. And I will also make this presentation available uh, that you can uh, use it uh, as, uh, as you wish. So the Cup market next year will be the 50th year of Cup Classic, which was the first produced by Simon Sach in 1971. Um, at that stage, we were allowed uh, to use the words Metaud Champenoise, but uh, in 1995, Metaud Champenoise was only reserved for uh, the producers of Champagne by the CIVC. So uh, we realized that we were be blocked by the, using the word um, Metaud Champenoise. So in 1992, um, 14 like-minded members came together because that was the total of uh, the producers at that stage. And uh, we had a long weekend in uh, Swaziland, of all places. And we obviously drank a lot of bubbles and we got to Cup Classique. Cup sound French, uh, and you see it referred to the Cape where the grapes are grown, and Classique, the traditional or classic method. So uh, that is how Cup, Cup Classique was developed. So today it's the alternative alternative name for uh, bottle fermented sparkling wines and um, I'll take you through some uh, wine laws as well. Uh, it is still the fastest category in South Africa. Currently it doubles up every four and a half years. Uh, association which was established uh, in 1992 has 103 members which represents uh, it's 47 uh, 47 percent of the total producers, but uh, in terms of volume, uh, those producers produce uh, just over 70% of uh, the total volume. Uh, out of the producers uh, of the association, we produce 9.5 million bottles and we represent 28 geographical areas in the Western Cape. Just some other, if you, you might ask well, who is the others, there is 159 other producers. So we are bordering on 261 or 262 producers or wineries that produce Cup Classic today. Uh, but they are small fry. You can understand if there's only 100, 130 SKUs and there's an, another 159 producers, most of them will net one, skip a year or skip two years and then produce another one. That is why I think uh, as an association, we are uh, representing the larger majority of um, Cup Classic. Um, there, there you have some others. So the total, the total production is uh, 10.5 million bottles. It's the latest statistics out of the 29 figures. Those of you aren't aware, I'm sure you're all familiar with South Africa. This is the Western Cape. And um, we have various different geographical regions uh, that is stipulated by the wine and spirits certification um, rings. Um, but to give you a better idea, I'll show you another map just now 
of you know everybody is homing down into smaller wards rather than just referring to a region so uh, so currently according to Savas there's uh, the, just over 200 producers of Cap Classic you can see how they've grown over the last uh, 10 years um, in 2019 uh, the, this is the, the, the region uh, um, producing areas. So uh, we have a few in the Northern Cape, Olifants, Rufir, Klenkarua. These are all the main regions out of the Western Cape. Um, just on briefly uh, as, as an introduction, uh, the verticulture, the 28 geographical areas, um, there's three major sort of soil types in the Western Cape. There's Table Mountain, Table Mountain Sandstone, decomposing granite, and some slate or shale. Uh, uh, and obviously there's also a little bit of uh, alluvial um, co um, compositions, what we call the valley floor. Uh, we, uh, we, we like, quite like the idea of being quite diverse in the Western Cape. So uh, as if you've traveled before, if you drive uh, from uh, Stellenbosch, to Witson, it's like two different countries. It's going from uh, sort of a maritime influence to a semi-arid area. Um, but uh, we, we, we do, um, we actually do not prescribe any varieties. So any varieties is, is allowed to be used in uh, Cap Classic. But obviously, uh, most producers do use uh, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, uh, as a little bit of Meunier used. But uh, there is also some Pinotage, Chenin Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, Cabernet Franc, and even Shiraz in some of the blends. So this is what I was meaning. Uh, if you refer to the Western Cape, where you have the seven sort of regions and then sub-regions, um, this is a little bit more in, in the sort of international language of an AVA, like you would get in California. You would notice that the Stellenbosch actually has like seven or eight different wards within the Stellenbosch region. Uh, you will see on the slide, I just can't show you all of them there because uh, of the pictures. Uh, but there's 53, currently 53 wards uh, in the Western Cape. So they all have a little bit of um, a story to tell um, purely on a geographical area or then obviously the close proximity to the oceans. We've got the Atlantic on the west coast and down south we have the Indian, Indian Ocean. So uh, maritime influence is quite uh, influential in these areas where the coast is running. So it's also known as the coastal region. Uh, vinification, this is just uh, overall uh, mostly stainless steel and wooden bags are permitted for fermentations. Uh, the legal, current legal requirement for uh, calling it a cup classic is only nine months. And um, we have um, we have gone to the Wine and Spirits Board and then from the vintage 2021, which means the year of Harvest, uh, it's going to move from nine months to 12 months. We're extremely happy about the, the movement from nine to 12 months, and we can uh, we can go into a little bit more detail. The other requirements uh, for Cap Classic is that it has to uh, have a minimum three bars of pressure, which is an international ruling for sparkling wine. And then obviously the same bottle that the wine was fermented in needs to go to the market. Uh, we are currently also working on a new year because we have some purists within the association which would like to have much more stricter ruling. So uh, obviously you can't change a current wine law. You actually have to write a new wine law and this takes three to five years to to uh, get writ you know, written into the legislations. Um, the styles that have emerged over the years uh, under Cap 
uh, obviously there's a vintage or non-vintage uh, classification. Um, I'm not prescribing to you that a vintage is better than a non-vintage. Um, there is lots of thought and maybe with some question and answer sessions, we can go into a little bit of detail there. Um, South Africa is just like the international ruling. If you, uh, if you call it a vintage, it has to be minimum 85% of that specific year. And how to use uh, older reserve wine into there. And obviously a, a non-vintage, which I prefer to call a multi-vintage, obviously is uh, from an existing year, but you will use more than 15% of older wine, and then you cannot have any reference to non-vintage. But stylistically for me, uh, I, I believe a non-vintage is the signature of a classic uh, bubbly house, where a vintage is more of an expression of the best that you've got for a specific year, but more about that a little bit later. The styles that have emerged, is, uh, it's, it's normal. There's nothing really new. It's Blanc de Blancs, Blanc de Noirs, normal blends, which is normally uh, uh, white blends. Then there's a rosé category, and there's some uh, of the wineries in the Cape that has a prestige or an iconic wine in their range. But the minimum risk requirement for all of this is still uh, currently nine months, moving to 12 months uh, least contact time. Just for interest, uh, most of you might not know, uh, there is a, a big movement in, uh, in South Africa for nectar. Nectar is sort of a self-proclaimed category uh, and it originated from Demisec. Demisec, according to the IV, needs to be a minimum of 32 grams per liter of sugar. And uh, a lot of nectars, I think there's seven of them in the market currently, uh, sort of plays where Prosecco is playing. You know, it, it is capturing a little bit more sugar, uh, but it's not as sweet as a Demisec. So uh, if you have questions on that, uh, just make a note of it and we can come back to that. There's the international ruling of sugars. Uh, Brut Nature or Brut Zero is less than three grams. Extra Brut is zero to six. Brut is up to 12 grams. Extra Dry, which is 12 to 17. Sec is 17 to 32 grams. Demi Sec is 32 to 50 grams. And then you have a sweet category called the Do, which is 50 plus. Um, this is interesting statistics that you can see. You can see uh, the blue, the blue uh, columns are uh, sparkling wine, which is not really the references. You can see we've been under the, the radar for a long, long time. Keeping in mind this is export uh, figures. But you can see from 2015, uh, when um, Sarvis split the Cap Classique to sparkling wine for the first time, that it's not shown before. They never had it as separate identities and we approached them and now since 2015 we can actually uh, show you some really interesting figures. Um, from uh, 15 onwards you can see the upward trend of, uh, of capitalism going on and um, we are um, in 2019 which is just on the behind the, all, the, all the things, it's uh, just around uh, 2 million bottles that leaves the South African shoreline of Cap Classic. This is total sales, which includes the local market. You can see a downward trend on, 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 on sparkling wine over the years and a gradual increase. And if, you know, again, from 14, it's, there's some nice things. And if you take those volumes, uh, as I mentioned for about between four and five years, we are doubling up uh, our, uh, our volumes of capacity. Um, there's two, two slides on, on, on volumes that leaves uh, South Africa. Um, the, UK, the UK is buzzing. Uh, the UK from 2018 to 2019, this year-on-year -year growth was, showed a 36% growth. Um, 
sort of the category is battling a little bit in, in, in America, but these are the most important markets from number one going down to 20. And obviously the rest of the exports is just under other countries. So you can study, you can study these maps. Uh, it seems that uh, the Netherlands and Germany sort of uh, is uh, on par sort of not losing ground, but it's also not gaining, but you can study all those things. The only unfortunate thing with Sweden, although it's so high up, it's all related to tenders and, you know, it's, it's only sort of every second year that the Swedish ask for a South African Cup Classic to go to their markets. This is uh, one on, so this, these are figures from 2019 to 2020. The UK is showing a very healthy growth. Uh, US is sort of dwindling. Um, there you can see the importance of uh, a tender. You can see there was a tender in 2018, 2019, but there was nothing there. So, uh, you know, you naturally just lose those sales and you can see the rest of the figures. So um, it might mean that we're losing 15% uh, over uh, not leaving the export shores, but the South African market is extremely uh, vibrant and uh, it's, it's pretty much growing at the, you know at 15% in the local markets. And if you do want to find out a little bit more, we finally have a, a, um, a communication channel for, uh, on the association. We developed and sort of updated our website. If you land on the page, this is what it looks like. You can learn a little bit more. There's a little bit more technical information. You can see who the members are and you can um, visit their websites from there. You can subscribe to our newsletter. We do a monthly newsletter now. So, uh, and then we have something what we call um, a members page. If we've had a technical meeting or anything like that, uh, or a tasting, uh, we have the, the presentations available that people can take and use. Um, also, uh, our uh, logo and things like that is uh, also um, available on downloads. Uh, Winnie, I don't know if there's any questions uh, up to now before we go to a little bit more intrinsics. Uh, yes, Peter, there are two questions. One is from Vivian. And she wants to know if the nectar is made in the same um, uh, way that MCC is made. And then the other question also sort of relates to that um, is, is, is the sparkling wine sector mostly tank fermented? Do you want to answer those two before we carry on? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, um, well, the, 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 tank, the, tank, the tank ferment is really only two labels that is tank fermented. It was a big category about uh, years ago. Uh, it was just about as big as the Cap Classique 30 years ago. But there's only two products uh, in the Charmat method, if we're referring to Charmat, or uh, sparkling wine. Sparkling wine, if I refer to sparkling wine in South Africa, it is carbonated. Um, there's, uh, there's really, I think there's about uh, 10,000 bottles that's done by the Charmat bot, uh, method, the Prosecco method. And I missed the first question. Uh, Winnie, the first uh, question is, is the nectar, um, oh, the nectar. also made in, yeah. in, in, in MCC? Yeah. Uh, when, when, when we refer to nectar, it's all made by um, uh, Cap Classic, MCC. Um, there is, uh, it's sort of just been drawn. I think we, we took on the from Muerton uh, um, Don's uh, Nectar Imperial um, that does extremely well. Those of you who don't know, Muerton Don, South Africa is the 10th largest importer of Muerton Don worldwide. Uh, so every three weeks, four weeks, they actually would have one of the big honchos out of Muerton uh, Don visiting South Africa. 
the biggest seller is uh, is the uh, Nectar Imperial from uh, Moet and Chandon. So I think we've just sort of climbed on the on the bandwagon, and you know, uh, we we have uh, we have Night Nectar from Kruna, we have Noble Nectar from Punkratz, we have Bliss Nectar from Grainbeck, we have Set Nectar from Simonsuch, and so they just go on, and I think. Pierre Jordan's just got one old um, nectar. So yeah, it's sort of an accepted ruling. And as I mentioned, there is no real uh, guidelines to the amount of sugar, but they definitely not in the brute category. Okay, we can carry on, thanks. So I, I thought it's also difficult to give you a whole philosophy uh, without sort of really preempting any questions. So uh, please just stay with me. The question or what when he asked me is, you know, what, what is it when you do or when you're in pursuit of the perfect bubble? Um, bubbles have consumed my life in the first place. Uh, I was very fortunate. I've had two, two Wine making jobs in my life. I started off with Achim von Arnhem in 1984. Uh, I spent seven mad years with Achim and then I joined Grainbeck and I'm still there today. So, uh, yeah, uh, from day one, I see myself as a specialist producer in, in, uh, in sparkling wine and obviously bottle fermented. But there is some things that you have to take uh, care of, most probably to get to the uh, the perfect bubble um, it remains a journey i i you know i think uh, one can never say you've got the ultimate bubble so uh, it remains uh, you your passion to always add something that you can um, uh, use to get to a much more refined bubble so i have again just slides that i think uh, most probably can um, use to uh, illustrate um, just to illustrate it uh, this is my motto my mantra really in pursuit of the perfect bubble yeah as you would mention you know nearly 40 years of making it you know uh, we're getting there uh, um, you know, we've read the book, it's just the t-shirt we still need or, you know, there ain't no cigar in this business. So, uh, I'll just give you a little bit, obviously there's some uh, Grainbeck slides because we have a sort of a beautiful library of some fantastic pictures. So, you know, is there such a thing as a uh, perfect bubble, which we can discuss in the question and answer session, but uh, it, to us it remains, uh, it remains a journey. There is no destination. So, uh, and I think it's really about a few details, the attention to detail that you do. And um, just as a background, uh, Grainbeck uh, bought the farm after a tragic flood, the uh, Lanesburg floods in 1983. The farm Madiba is in Robertson. I joined the Beck family in 1990. Our maiden vintage was in 91. Uh, I'll show you on the map. Uh, we are two hours east of Cape Town. Uh, but today is, it's, it's a big farm, but we, uh, we preserve a lot. We only have 140 hectares uh, in Robertson. And uh, if you ask me, Robertson was a lot of uh, um, our competitors in the Cape have realized that there is a huge advantage of sourcing grapes from Robertson. Robertson has three advantages. It's got sunshine, it's got a high incidence of natural limestone deposits in the soils, and it's got a huge uh, dynal shift. Now, a dynal shift is the difference between day and night temperature, which we can discuss a little bit. Uh, 2020 vintage was done, and we our current production is uh, just under 3,000 tons. Uh, to that amount of cases. So the terroir, there's a lot of limestone 
Um, this is uh, what we call red karua, just uh, the background picture. But uh, if you sort of follow the lines and you can just see through all of the, there's a lot of sort of natural elements lying in there. And uh, if you don't have the red karoo and you're on shale, if you, if you break the shale, uh, they also get into these complete li limestone banks, which is really a great advantage for natural acidity. Um, and uh, obviously we grow Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Uh, we talked about the dynal shift. The dynal shift, we, we can have a comfortable 31, uh, or 36 to a 40 degree day, but at night it will be lower than 15 degrees. You go to Stellenbosch, you'll get 32 or 34 degrees at night and the night temperature will be 26. Really, say too close to the ocean, they don't get the diurnal shift, uh, which is the cold air that is sucked in during the heat by day. And obviously, um, uh, the prevailing wind is from the south, so uh, you know Robertson is first in line to be cooled down. And uh, then um, we we proud of, of of sort of precision viticulture. Um, we we use automatic weather stations. We are starting to use uh, satellite imagery to study vigor in our blocks. And the whole idea is not to make it over vigor, or uh, it's just to get more of a homogeneous block. So uh, it, it gives you a good starting for the quality fruit that comes to the winery. Um, Grainbeck, we produce 70% of our own, and the others come from nine ge other geographical areas. This is just to give you the lie of the land. Robertson, the farm Adiba is over here. You can see it actually lies on the continental shelf and this trough actually sucks in the cold, cold uh, prevailing wind from the south during summer. And uh, that's why we, you know, it bakes by day, but it's freezing at night. And that keeps natural acidity in, 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 uh, in the product. Uh, in the base wines. And then other areas of interest for, for us is obviously much closer proximity to the oceans. There's the Yimbal and Arda Valley, Stanford, uh, and we have long-term long contracts uh, with growers. Some of them go back 20 years and uh, some of them are uh, also new. So we always find some interesting parcels somewhere. And these, these parcels will then obviously be, um, we have full autonomy. We don't buy just a few tons of grapes. We actually would manage a block and we will make our own decisions of when uh, to pick it for, for harvest. Those of you are uh, keen about sort of which mean temperatures, um, this is a study that they did for Sauvignon Blanc, and you can see the areas in red, just quickly, are uh, the average mean temperatures, which is 17 to 19 in, uh, in February, which is the hottest month. And you can actually see that every area, it's just not one specific area, but every area into the Robertson area will have cool area. So, uh, you know, I embrace sunshine, so I don't mind to say we're in a warmer area, but the rest of the world's catching up and they have to learn a lot how to manage sunshine. So uh, uh, it is just interesting to know that there are cool spots all over the Western Cape. I'm not going to bore you with the detail, but uh, this is just the schema schematics. Um, of uh, whole bunch handling. So the whole bunch, uh, whole bunches come from the vineyard, goes into the press. There's a separation period, which I will elude now with some slides. Uh, fermentation, then we do the blending and then we do the tirage bottling and the rest you know all pretty well. So that's just as a sort of summary. Whole bunch principle, I believe 65% 
the success of a perfect bubble starts of how you handle the fruit from it when it leaves the vine till it's in juice form. You've been to many wineries all over the world. We all brag the same. We say we have minimal movement. We've got the best stainless steel. We've got the best cooling equipment, the best pumps. But I believe it's how you do it. This is a Pinot Noir berry. So you can see if you squeeze it very gently, it starts crystal clear. And only when the skin is, uh, is, is split, that is when you will get some juice running. But it's all regulated by um, whole bunch. It's vital uh, to make your own separation of the cuvee fraction to the tie fraction or press fractions. And uh, this is a typical Chardonnay bunch before and after. So uh, I always tell me if I'm a gentle squeezer. There, there, you can see, there you can see just a classic um, pressing program. It's considered to be a champagne program, but we adapt it every year for Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir has got a thicker skin, so uh, we have to apply a little bit more pressure. But you can see the initial stages of uh, the Cuvée fraction, which is the light gray. Uh, never goes over 0.8 bars of pressure and the maximum that we would reach is around uh, 1.2 maximum 1.3 in the press in the press thing so you know a champagne cycle it's not like a normal wine cycle where you will press for a certain period and then it deflates it will pressures applied over time Gradually it increases and obviously one of these cycles could be 40 minutes. You know, I, I know of uh, um, other winemakers that talks that, you know, they get the cuvee fraction and their press fraction and only is one, one and a half hours to get the split. Uh, our period of pressing is uh, between three and three and a half hours. If you take it from start to finish. Um, and I think that is what will make the difference, and I'll show you why. Uh, on Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir is a softer skin. You can see we're using much, much lower pressures. And again, similar to what you've just seen, you know, uh, on Pinot Noir, we will never even reach uh, 0.8 bars of pressure. So the Cuvée fraction is uh, what is considered to be the best purest juice. Uh, will be kept separate from the press fraction. This is a typical Chardonnay um, quality fraction, which is on the left, and the press fraction, you can see there's a little bit more flesh, obviously a little bit more fleshiness or color that also comes into it, but at least it's separated. So all the press fractions uh, will on Chardonnay from the same block will be consolidated in uh, a day's press and that will be kept separate and this quality fraction will then ferment separately on its own. So you can see here uh, the pro progress of uh, the bunches being squeezed till uh, you get to the final uh, end result. On Pinot Noir, Pinot Noir is simple, it starts with no color but longer it obviously remains in the press, there's also uh, a time span uh, also get natural extraction uh, the longer it remains in the press and obviously the more pressure you apply. So on, Chardonnay, uh, on Pinot Noir we might have three separations depending on the amount of color. We, there is a, a way to uh, remove color and uh, it's standard practice in most, most uh, uh, sparkling wine producing countries that they can uh, use some um, carbon to remove it, which is known as charcoal. But yeah, it's completely forbidden language and uh, we, you know, we don't use it. We'd rather separate our colors that we can use for blending that we don't have to add any red wine. So that will give you a, a good idea of uh, these just juices um, going into fermentation. And you can see, you know, 
Pinot Noir with extremely light colors, Pinot Noirs with much more color. And obviously it's also, it depends on uh, how long the pressing period was or how long the grapes have taken from another geographical area to get to Robertson uh, for pressing, because that all has an influence on some color. So the thing there you can see, uh, uh, we would normally have 140 in components. It's a little bit more like uh, the bigger uh, champagne houses, but it's really important to have them separately because you know we can we can cherry pick cherry pick and be much more precise to get to the final result we want to be depending on which wine we're making up. Kiraj bottling I'm not going to really talk about but the the the, impo the importance well we did talk about the blending you can uh, read through that about the, the blending of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir the use of perpetual we can rather talk about that in uh, the question and answer session. But least contact time is to me uh, another important uh, differentiator to get to a final, uh, much more refined bubble. And um, as I mentioned, we're going from 10 months to 12 months in the vintage 2021. That is the minimum classification. And um, our bottles would line our coldest parts in our winery between 12 and 14 degrees. And um, we, this is our sort of minimum. Uh, our non vintages will remain 15 months on the lease, our vintage collection, four years, and our um, siege wine, the Cuvée Clive, will be a minimum of 60 months. And um, obviously, <clears throat> your blend will also have an influence on the effect of time on the lees. A lot of studies have been done on that. And um, it definitely, the more red grape you use in blend, uh, the, sh the shorter you can dial back uh, for them on the lees. But uh, we can discuss that as well. Another interesting thing is, uh, is the final stage at, at disgorgement, that is when we remove the yeast from the wine. Um, it, it is amazing how much, you know, 10 milliliters sounds very small, you know, it's like two teaspoons, if you can imagine, two teaspoons going into a, a 750. Um, but that effect of that dosage is really a vital component to the end result. It's all about balance. You have to consider how long the wine has been on the lease, what market segment you want to get to. And uh, you also have to sort of look at the intrinsics of the wine. Does the wine need freshness or does it need a little bit more complexity? This will influence the base of your dosage or your edition. So, uh, your liquor de expedition in our our one for all of our wines we have a separate uh, um, dosage for everyone. We're not using one dosage for all of them. Each one ha will have their own uh, dosage. Uh, obviously, we talked about the balance. Um, it takes a while to work out um, the wine's characteristics, so we would follow it. Uh, time. And um, obviously then once the dosage is in, then the final cork and wire is on. I'll just show you again, these are the sugar levels, but we've had a previous slides. This is the international ruling, so uh, um, it doesn't differ. If you speak about champagne, you speak Francia Corta, you speak uh, about English sparkling, uh, or American sparkling, wherever you go, it's uh, it's uh, it's the same. So uh, it's the same ruling. Just for those of you who don't know, this is our portfolio of uh, Graham Beck. We have a non-vintage collection. Uh, they are blends of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, normally in equal amounts. Depending on the year, there's a two three percent swing either to Pinot Noir or to Chardonnay. Uh, we also then 
the nectars, which uh, is really 95% of this wine only is sold in South Africa. So very little goes to the export market. Then we have our vintage collection, which is an expression of Chardonnay, expression of Pinot Noir. Uh, if you want to get into skinny jeans, you drink Brut Zero. Um, and then we have uh, the Prestige Cuvée Cuvée. Then for the wine geeks out there, um, what do we do behind the scenes? We constantly proud ourselves to, I don't think we are really serious innovators, but we do follow some trends, but our research and development program is huge. This is just some of the things we are doing and I'll touch just on three of them if you don't mind. But we would look at the uh, Chardonnay clones and the uh, aromatic profiles. We also do it on Pinot Noir. We look at what flavors do we get from each geographical area. So if you visit the winery, we can show you a Chardonnay from Stellenbosch, Darling, Elgin, Robertson, and even it's called Swillendam. And the same for Pinot Noir. It's always just to know where and what flavor because for instance <clears throat> the flavor of Pinot Noir from Robertson is like a light strawberry note but if you're going to uh, Durbanville or Stellenbosch it's like cherries so you know sometimes you need strawberry and cherry to have an expression of red berry fruit or if you you know you can guide it that way but at least we are far then we are working and isolating on natural yeast natural wines always on the front foot uh, of um, conversations. So uh, we are doing that. We are looking at the influence of row directions, which is which in our second year now, and that is flipping amazing stuff. But a little bit more about that. And then uh, crown cap versus the traditional cork fermentation is ongoing. Um, and then um, when he asked me to touch on so uh, this is just um, the beginning of uh, looking for our own natural yeast. We take uh, Chardonnay grapes from two blocks and uh, we generate a wild, wild or natural fermentation on that. We then send uh, those samples to Nikfu Bay, which is the uh, Agriculture Council, and they, they do a DNA referencing. And, we have definitely found a strain that is not available through the commercial database that they've got. So uh, if we can do it one more year, we might have our own natural uh, yeast that we can use for fermentation. So this is just the pl plotting of the different things. It's a little bit insightful, but uh, have some time and read through that if you'd like. This is fascinating, um, cork, cork fermentation versus crown cap. Um, we're also assisting Paul Gerber, who is at, at Cormant. He's actually doing his uh, master's uh, on uh, the effect of, or the flavor profiles that you get under cork fermentation. So uh, we're assisting uh, them uh, or he, with him for his research. It's interesting that you can see crown cap definitely lies completely away from cork. Um, and um, these are just five samples just to see whether they all lie together or whether they are separate. But we do now know that there is a difference between cork fermentation and cap fermentation. And we can even taste it. And you can see about consistency of using different suppliers of cork because that's another contentious issue is where corks are coming from. But you can see that uh, there is some common um, groupings from the same supplier. So it, it looks like one supplier that's the flavors you're going to get if you buy from another supplier 
that's the flavors you're going to get. And these are just the, the, the most important change is the Gaelic acid. Gaelic acid is the, the strongest uh, natural element in cork. And obviously through the fermentation, I think uh, the interaction between the volume of the wine and the cork stopper does increase uh, that to what is in the crown cap. But, uh, and the interesting thing is, this is just like an in-house work we, we're doing. We take a crown cap and we fill a glass with 100 mils of uh, bubbly. And we take the cork fermented one and also fill it. And it stands on little micro scales. And we just look at the trend of how quickly the, the bubbles dissipate. And it's just interesting, but it's also not rock science. But it's interesting that the, the, the one under cork is losing, losing a little quicker bubble. And the only reason or thing that we can say for now why it's like that, it's because of the natric Gaelic acid, which has got some uh, phenolics, is obviously the phenolics is part of the flavor aroma. And if you've poured it, uh, it as a nucleation site for the bubbles to run off quicker. So it's really interesting um, if you like that type of thing. One last thing uh, is just the science of a glass. Uh, it can be complicated and I, uh, <laughs> I can take you through lots of uh, sort of equations, but um, the guy in the forefront of studying um, with high-speed photography is uh, a professor in the Reims University, Gerard Leger Belair, and he actually has visited South Africa three years ago, and he's doing some fascinating, fascinating work. First of all, you can do this at home. If you've poured a bubble, there's a lot of activity as it starts, and over time, obviously, this will dissipate. It's a little bit like losing the bubbles, but this just to show you from up top. And uh, so this is filling, A is filling after five minutes, after 10 minutes, and after 25 minutes, you can see that uh, the bubbles do dissipate. But what they've also realized, and this one is most probably the most simplest to understand, when, when the bubble nucleates uh, from the bottom of the glass, you can see as it travels, the bubble increases. It's because of the decompression. It's a little bit like scuba diving. If you release a little air bubble quite far below uh, the water surface, by the end, uh, the bubble has rise to the top. It is three or four times its size. And they've realized that uh, the same happens in a flute. So, uh, your flute's bubble is a little closer or bigger than it if the bubble didn't travel that much. But I'll show you with some examples. This is just some dyes they use just to show the vortex that there is movement once the bubble is dissipated and popped on the top. There is sort of an aromatic swirl. Um, and uh, if you can't put your nose into a glass, you're also not going to see those aromas. So uh, it's the research that has been done. You know the history of the Champagne Coupe? This was uh, a book by Patrick Forbes. Maybe some of you have got it in a library. But this was thought of being the first Champagne Coupe. Uh, but that myth was busted. Um, the story goes it was copied from uh, Maria Antoinette's uh, breast. Um, and, uh, we, so we're not sure, but that is the coupe. That was the original sort of design. The previous slide is actually uh, uh, um, uh, not related to wine at all. So, uh, but there you had the original coupe. And when you fill that, when you fill the coupe, uh, uh, you know, there's very little uh, surface left. Uh, I think I've got another slide, no, I don't have. 
You even have the Marne, which is a copy of uh, Kate Moss. And um, but there you can see the shapes and sizes for bubbly has long gone from the flute or the coupe to the flute. And now we are uh, enjoying it in more of a tulip shape uh, design or then obviously a slightly larger bowl. Uh, these things you can do at home, take one bottle of wine, uh, one bottle of bubbly, three different glasses and you'll see the effect. It's really amazing. We offer this type of tasting when visitors uh, arrive to our winery. And there's some beautiful stemware out there. I'm not advocating that today you're going to smash all your flutes. Uh, flutes has got a has got a a very good way of presenting a, a, the bubbles. You can study the bubble much better in a flute than we see in. Uh, this is our collection uh, at Grambeck. We have uh, the Riedel Overture glass which is a slightly evolved uh, flute, um, slightly wider, so you don't need to pour it right to the top. Um, and then for our vintages, we use the Riedel Veritas glass, and for our uh, Coupe Clive, we use the Lehman Philip Mess uh, uh, glass. Oh, and... Um, just one more thing, we're going to go into questions and answers now. Um, um, you, if you want any further information or obviously when, he, when he's got my, my email, but for some reason I was going to uh, have to show you my shoes. Uh, that's my shoes. Uh, it's Guni Kao. Um, and uh, a great friend of mine, James Brown from Hartenberg, uh, always sources these things. So uh, yeah, those are my uh, Nguni shoes that I take on my travel. So uh, yeah, there it is. Wonderful, Peter. Thank you very much. And I'm pleased about the shoes because that's the, that's the way I recognize you at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got quite a few questions. So I'm going to just go through them from the beginning. Um, okay, Peter May wants to know if uh, non-members of the MCC Association can use the term MCC on the label, and I think the answer is yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, we, because it was written uh, prior to uh, the, um, the association really starting to work on it, it was known as, it was written in as the alternative name to Metal Champenois. So yes, anybody can use it. Okay, and then, oh, why, what's going on here now? Okay, and then um, MCC, uh, that's also from, from Peter, MCC recommends three champagne varieties and are we as the MCC Society pushing to use, to do this as well? Um, no, uh, I think we, we, we embrace uh, diversity in South Africa. I don't think we want to be exclusive. Um, and um, we, however, we do know, and those who are specialist producers, that Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and then Munia for that matter, is sort of uh, the to express uh, flavor aromatics in, in the secondary fermentation we don't exclude any other variety. I think it's part of our sort of sunshine, rainbow nation approach. Uh, Peter, I didn't see the last part of the question, but he's also wanting to know if other varieties are used um, because of the, the, the warming temperatures or just as personal choice from the producer? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I. I think, I think Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, because we picked that so early in, in summer, you know, uh, is much better than using Chenin Blanc, for instance, or uh, Shiraz. Because if you are picking 
get low sugars because the wine will go, undergo through a se secondary fermentation, the flavor development in the varietal aromatics is much better evolved in Chardonnay and Pinot Noir than that of Pinotage, Chenin Blanc or Shiraz, if you understand what I'm saying. So you're getting much more herbaceous aromatics in your base wines, which is another thing you have to take care of. Because the bubble is a magnifier, you know, the bubble magnifies four and a half times. And so it's, it, it's something you have to take care of in other varieties. Thanks. And then uh, Ian would like to know, he says, um, he heard you, you referred to scavenger yeasts. And can you just talk a little bit more about that, please? Uh, well, a yeast is a scavenger. It, it, it thrives on all sugar. So, you know, it, 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 is, uh, it maybe, um, I, I don't know the question because sca uh, uh, let me, let me, uh, Peter, let me, um, Ian, won't you unmute yourself and just ask the question because maybe I didn't ask it properly. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, yes, I just heard you interviewed um, by Jantis Robinson once and uh, you were talking about keeping the, the wine really clean and making sure that you did get rid of all of the sugar. Uh, and you, you just referred to using scavenger yeasts. And I wondered, wondered if they were different to nor the normal yeast you use, or if it was just the fact that all yeasts are scavengers. Yeah, um, maybe, yeah maybe I didn't put it in uh, the right context. A yeast is a scavenger. So uh, there is a big, there's a big difference between non cerevisia yeast, which is uh, commercial yeast and that of natural yeast. Some natural yeast aren't strong enough scavengers and they might lose uh, uh, they might lo lose the battle to finish a fermentation. So the yeast that we use is uh, currently is all a cerevisia uh, strain of yeast which is known as a scavenger. <clears throat> it will even take over from any other yeast you use, make you have a complete fermentation uh, in the in the base wines. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and Heather, Heather would like to know um, if carbon and, and or charcoal is forbidden in in, in to remove colour in in MCC. <clears throat> no, it's not. Uh, it's uh, it's it's used. It's used, well, you know, so, how can I say? I, I, I've been into amazing cellars, which I thought, wow, you know, it's too, it's, they are too authentic. But, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you're allowed through the right door, you see things in a different way. So uh, um, I just don't like uh, the, um, the use of charcoal because uh, I can, I, we can manage it because of the attention to detail that we do is to maybe take a short uh, cuvee fraction, have a little bit more of the cuvee running into the press, which will give you a, a good base for a rosé, for instance, if you're thinking about color. So it's not forbidden, uh, pretty much, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's used in in a lot of wineries. I just we just don't like to use it. And also from Heather, do you use jetting at disgorgement? Um, we've been following uh, the jetting principle. Uh, I think it's something that we can still add at uh, disgorging. Um, it's uh, it's it's something uh, it's something that we could could add to the final thing. You know, I'm. Uh, it's supposed to jetting is a little micro spray of water and sulfur. That's all it is, really. Uh, and it just uh, it just uh, irritates the surface once the dosage has been filled and the bottle is running towards the the corker. Uh, uh, the spray goes in there and it uh, irritates the surface and the. The foam then runs up to the top 
of the bowl before the cork goes in. So it makes sure that there is no oxygen uh, bottle at corking. Heather, is that okay? Or do you want to ask him anything else? You're okay, oh, great. Then Britt would like to know if, the, if you notice a difference between the different markets when it comes to the dressage. I, I, I'm still battling to, to find the, the, the real answer for that. Um, if you read up, uh, if you read and follow some, some of the champagne houses, they intend to have a special dosage that will go to the US, for instance. Um, but uh, no, I, uh, we, 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 we make it. And um, obviously, there's a close relationship to understanding what the market wants, but uh, we, d we don't make uh, different dosages or levels of sugars for various markets. Thank you. And then Peter May also wants to know, this is an interesting one, about uh, the, the non-vintage grain back, the Rona Brut. Is that a special one from m &S or what is it actually? Uh, no, that is, uh, it's our standard non-vintage rosé. Um, and uh, if you want to do business with uh, m &S, you have to allow them to use their label. Otherwise, they don't support you. So, uh, oh, it's okay. the wine. Um, we, we, do, we do, however, you know, um, I think... Uh, I think it's cyclical, you know, it depends on uh, the, the, amount, the amount of input the wine buyer wants to give, you know. We are never shy to say, come and sit, do a dosage trial and look at the various ones. But invariably, the one they like is the one they tasted and they say, well, can they have it under M&S? So it's the same as the non-vintage group. Okay, thank you. you. happy, Peter? Okay. And then Britt wants to also know what, with natural yeast, what are the advantages of using natural yeast? Um, I will sleep better if I, using something, you know, that I know does the job. Um, however, the research up to now that we've done with our natural yeast uh, I think just adds another another story, really, that we have our own selected yeast that comes from our own vineyards. I think uh, it's a plus point. You're not going to get more pounds or more rand for for your for your um, effort. Um, it's just there is there is a definite movement towards naturalness and sustainable things, and I think it's part of the sustainable side of the business is that if we can use something naturally and we, by the way, we know that that yeast does both fermentations. It does the primary fermentation, gives clean fermentation, and uh, it also does the secondary fermentation. So it's a very strong yeast, but we have to uh, repeat it one more year and then we can isolate it uh, with the University of Stellenbosch. Okay, thanks. And Keith Granger wants to know, and I hope I'm asking this correctly, Keith, unless you want to ask it yourself. He says, I'm pleased that you're using green grass for, oh, Keith, you go. Keith? Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Yes, I'm very pleased to see you stuck with green glass for the Brut Rosé and the Brut Rosé Vintage. How much do you fear the production of DMS from sulfur-containing amino acids if the wine's exposed to UV light? It's, it's, fasc it's another fascinating story, but uh, I, I learned very quickly in my early years, I was very fortunate uh, to sit with Tom, Tom Stevenson. And, um, you know, uh, we were together at the International uh, Symposium funny enough, at um, Denby's, and um, wow, you just have to smell it once and then you realize this ain't going to work. So uh, yeah, flint or clear glass is definitely uh, 
a huge danger for um, uh, the sulfides. And um, uh, I'm, I'm to use, there is a movement because I was at Plumpton College uh, two years ago. Um, and um, I, 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 I went through their research thing and where they looked at various different UVs and different colors of UVs and the effect on clear glass and things like that. And the definite next movement is people are going to amber. Amber yes. is even a stronger, uh, um, uh, has a stronger barrier yeah. for, for, for any UV uh, affection now. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> and then um, our own Merrill wants to know, can you tell us a little bit more about the use of perpetual reserve? Uh, perpetual, perpetual reserve in our non-vintages is the mainstay. I think uh, perpetual reserve is really important if you want to um, uh, keep uh, consistency and continuity, continuity going through. As I mentioned, our philosophy at Graham Beck on non-vintage is really the signature of the house. It's, some, it's a style that we started 30 years ago and we've never varied off from it. Um, we do have uh, sufficient sunshine, so, you know, it's not, uh, you know, uh, trying to beef up the, the style, but the reserve is there just to keep that consistency going. Some years we have a bit of a tutti frutti aromatic, which we can turn down by using the older wine. And sometimes, you know, if you've got a little higher acidity, you need a little bit more mouthfeel, and that is how we interact with it. And our perpetual reserve, which um, uh, in the beginning were individual components, is today one component. We use that reserve a little bit like a modern Solera, um, which means if we make up the this year's blend and we've decided that 6% of the reserve will go in, we'll take 6% of our reserve wine, put it into the this year's non-vintage blend, and we'll use the this year's non-vintage blend to go back into the reserve wine. So uh, in that way, we keep a golden thread running through and the perpetual side of the business it's just it was started when uh, we started the winery so our perpetual reserve is 30 years old. Wow thank you Peter. Um, if there are any other questions I think you can all, all email them to Peter but I just want to say we've had quite a few comments on your shoes Peter. So, <laughs> on mine? So your shoes. Oh. oh. <laughs> so don't don't ever get rid of them. Um, oh, wow. and, then I, <laughs> and I just want to finish by saying um, you're all looking at the oldest person who's won the best newcomer at the Platter Wine Awards. And you heard Peter saying that he's been in the business for more than 40 years, but he started a little uh, retirement project. Um, and he, he also received in that same 2020 Platter Guide the um, highest points ever awarded to a, an, an MCC. I don't know if you can see the label. Oh, I'm trying to get it in the picture. It's a Peter Ferreira, um, which unfortunately, hint, hint, my last bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. uh, Peter, thank you. Thank you very much. And I must say, I hope you don't move on very quickly because we all love listening to you.